Good morning. Uh, the title of this message is the Bible is uh, reading the Bible. You should use the four who two principle. Now, I want you to turn with me to um, Isaiah chapter eight, verse one. So um, it's the new year and you all make resolutions and how many plan to read this Bible at least once through this year. It's a, it's a very, you know, hefty book. It has 66 books. It has 1,189 chapters. It has 31,102 verses. It has 783,137 words. And that comes up to 3,116,480 letters. And this website, I guess everything you read on the Internet, and they say this is the King James Bible, there are 6,468 commands. There's over 8,000 predictions. I believe that. Um, fulfilled prophecies, 3,268. Unfulfilled prophecies, 3,140. 3, Unfulfilled prophecies that we know this is... A book like no other book ever written. Um, it has the beginning of the end, and where you fit in determines which part of the Bible is to you. Um, I ask you to turn to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1. As you can see, I'm waiting for Nancy to uh, get there first. Over the years, she has recorrected my gross mispronunciations. <laughs> And if you look at uh, um, chapter 8, verse 1, there's a man listed there. And this man has the distinction of having the longest name in the Bible. Isaiah 8, verse 1. Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning. And then there's this. Meher Shalabaz Bashbaz. What does your Bible say, Chuck? Anything? Uh, Isaiah 8, 1. Bela Shalar Hasbas. As the distinguished of being. <laughs> All right. And uh, but one of the criticisms you, you'll, you'll hear about the Bible is it has many long words. But these are, you know, proper names and events that you don't translate. They're, they're the names. And no matter what the translations, there's a lot of words that should not get translated. So it can't, uh, it can't be made easier. The longest verse is Esther 8, 9. It has 78 words. The shortest wor verse in your King James Bible is John chapter 11, verse 35. What's that? Anyone? Jesus wept. Good, Joyce. Um, can we uh, have some more participation in the audience? And I, I, I did the series on Psalms, and I was wrong. And I went back and I counted the words, and it wasn't even close. I said that Psalms 110 was the shortest uh, chap, uh, book in the Bible, but it's not. Anyone venture to say what it, what is? Yeah, it's Psalm 117. I counted it. It's got 32 words. Um, the longest book is what? In words, longest book in words. Psalms. What's the longest uh, chapter in the Bible? 119. These are two pick questions from the hayride. <laughs> the number of times God appears, 4,094. Number of times Lord appears, 6,781. Forty different authors written over a time span of 1,500 years. It's an amazing book. It, now, and it also says the Bible has been translated in over 1,200 languages. I did not even know there were 1,200 languages on the earth. 
Now, what if you wanted to read the Bible through in one year? You would have to read. You don't have to, you don't have to get a chart because the chart, I don't like it because it cuts it off at the verse. I don't think you should cut off at a verse if it contains the thought. Then you're just doing it to do it. But if you read three chapters a day, four on weekends, you'll be done before next year. Just three chapters a day. I read also that if you read it out loud, it would take 70 hours to read it out loud. Why is that important to someone like me? I am a very, very slow reader. I didn't do a lot of outside reading. I read the textbooks in high school and college and very little else. And what, what do you know about that? Pleasure reading, my sister, they say, reads over a 1,000 words a minute. I'm, I'm reading, they say, 300 words a minute. So, I, you know, there, there are people, I've run into people that claim they read this Bible in two times in one month. And some of us older saints in here know this person who claimed it. He ended up going to jail. So there's a difference about reading it and, and getting it into. Now, if you read your three chapters on weekdays and four on weekends, but if you study the Bible, you'll say, nowhere does it say to do that. You know, it, it does say, though, to study, thy, to, study the, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, doing what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. And what's the first word of that verse? Study. So the word of God does say to study it. There's a lot of uh, difference, I think, between reading it and studying it. There's also that verse in the Old Testament, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. It's how you do it. And we'll, we'll get into more of that uh, um, um, later. And also what's a noble person as defined in the Bible in the context of Acts chapter 17. These were no, more noble than those at Thessalonica in that they searched the scripture. And the key thing about that verse is it uses the word daily. And we'll, we'll get into that. But to say you're going to pick up, I, I read a book years ago, um, a lot of years ago, and I forgot what, what we would call a cult. He says he had no, he was an atheist and he picked up the Bible and started reading it and he formed this cult. And it's a big one too. So the book is dangerous if you don't approach it the way God does. Now, again, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelations. But the vast majority, you have to keep in mind, is not written to. Well, you should look at this book and say, who is being spoken to? What is its context? And who is doing the speaking? Now, if you, if you turn to um, 2 Chronicles chapter 6. You'll see what I mean. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Usually the Bible is very specific to who it's being spoken to. And nowhere does this uh, come up better than I think in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And if you go down to verse 3 and you look at... Um, and the king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation of who? Israel. And all the congregation of who? Israel stood. Verse 4. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of who? And um, you see that phrase, God of Israel? It's used 108 times where he's specifically saying he is the God of of Israel. And if you study your Bible, it all makes sense that when we read that there, Israel is to be a kingdom of priests throughout the whole world, so it's God through a nation to us, Gentiles, it all makes sense. But
But if you don't know that going in and you just blindly plow through the Bible, you're going to have troubles. And troubles what? We don't need. Now, if you go down through this chapter, you will find you will find it's used, I believe, 26 times. So it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out who this chapter is written to. It's written to Israel. And in fact, the majority of the Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and a lot of the book of Acts are written to Israel. And if you miss that, you're going to have troubles and troubles we don't need now um i asked my starbucks assistant ella <laughs> emma <laughs> sorry <laughs> if she could pass this out <laughs> they were drinking uh M mcdonald's this morning uh, they must have fallen on hard times <laughs> I, I, for time's sake, I did not want to turn to um, all those passages this morning. But it, it is, if you look here, it's the dietary requirements that man is supposed to have on the face of the earth. And we just pick it up in Genesis 1. As early as Gen Genesis 1, he is telling Adam and Eve, and God said, Behold, I give you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for what? Adam and Eve are what? Vegetarians. Now let's just go just a few chapters over to 9. Every, move, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. What's that book by Ted Nugent? Kill it and grill it, right? <laughs> now, in addition to a salad, you can have what? Meat. And then, all of a sudden, just a few books written by the same human author. It's the book, the Bible's written by the divine author, but the human author... In Leviticus 11, verse 1 to 9, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying unto them, Speak ye unto the children of Israel, saying, There are the beasts which ye shall eat among the beasts that are of the earth, where wheresoever parteth the hoof, and is cleaven footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, and ye shall eat. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew, them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, he divideth not the hoof, he is unclean to you. And it goes on, and it says, essentially, how many like surf and turf? Well, you can't have that lobster anymore. It doesn't have scales on it. Catfish? Smoked catfish? No, 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 no. Bacon, eggs, and toast? Forbidden. Sausage? <laughs> Gone. The dietary restriction that he put on man. And then I put how late this goes, that you can prove that the book of Acts is still written to Israel is in Acts 10.13. When he was removing the dietary restriction, and there came a voice in him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. It's past my lips. What? What are you asking me to do? And then we get to our apostle, the apostle Paul, and he says, Forbidden to marry and commanded to abstain from meats, which God has created to receive with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. So in this one book, we have four different dietary commands. Right now, it's not just, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can have what? 
anything, anything. And it wasn't always that way. So you went from a vegetarian to anything to eating only certain to, and back to anything in this book. It's not all written to you. Again, it's okay to go from Genesis to Revelations, but just keep in mind of who it's written for, who it's written to, and the rightly divided principle. And that makes us different. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Second Corinthians 9, verse 7. If you were unorientated to the Bible and you didn't know if you were supposed to give anything, by the time you got to Genesis 28, you will find out that, you know, you're supposed to give a tenth of what you make before taxes. Not even it. But then... You come to Second Corinthians nine seven, says every man according to it he purposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly. We don't hold that what we're different here than what you read in the early part of the Bible and what you see out there in Christianism, because if you like what we do because it's coming from God and it's God's instructions for us today, and you want to participate, you can what? Not give grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a what kind of giver? Cheerful giver. Um, the pa uh, Mary's pastor, um, when, when uh, sh she was an early big guy, Craig Massey, and, and uh, he put it more bluntly, said, if you don't want to give, then keep your money out of that offering plate because we don't want it. That's coming from the pulpit, and, you know, we don't say it. We never push an offering here. Because what's the verse say? A cheerful giver. Once in a while, we will let you know a need, and if you want to participate, then do it. If you don't, God loves a cheerful giver. So we don't teach tithing that you must do something. You take off in the Bible, and you're going to see things like tithing, heave offerings, Peace offerings, burnt offerings, this meal, that meal, bring to the church. You know, just just the dietary changes, the offering changes. You have to know when you're starting out in the Bible, what's to you? And here and today, we don't teach tithing because our apostle doesn't teach any certain requirement. We walk in liberty being free from sin, not in legalism or in a free-for-all lifestyle that the world seems to be promoting today. Look at Romans chapter 8. Look at Romans chapter 8. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. It's a huge, huge difference in the way we walk in here. Because we have been what? When we trusted that Jesus Christ, who is God, died for our sins and rose again from the dead, it is finished. He gave us everything he's going to give us. And it's up to us to find the rest of it. But the issue of um, losing your salvation is not so. We, we teach here, once forgiven, always forgiven. And yes, there's a natural consequences to sin. But once saved, always saved. So we walk in liberty, being free now to serve him with a thankgiving heart. Israel had no such commandment. So if um, you're going through your Bible from Revelation to, I'm sorry, from Genesis to Revelation, you might run in, I had you in uh, Second Chronicles, I meant to keep you there.
I want at this time Second Chronicles chapter 17. And in programming, we call it the if-then-else principle. And it was invented in the Bible. And it says, if you do this, then I, God, will do that. Now, there's a lot of Christianism out there. There are a nation that was built on this principle that if you... If you do, God will do. It's not the same today. Look, look at um, get um, Exodus 19 in one hand and Second Chronicles 7 in the other. Exodus 19. And Second Chronicles seven fourteen. We already looked at Second Chronicles chapter six, and the number of times we know that these passages are addressing the nation Israel. But if you were unorientated to that, and you think we're spiritual Israel today, when you run into Second um, Chronicles chapter seven verse fourteen, your whole method of living on the planet would not be in liberty. You would not be free in liberty because you worry about this verse. If my people, which are called my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my voice and turn from their wicked ways, and then what's that next word? Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. If you take that verse the wrong way, if you're unorientated to this dangerous book, you could live a life of misery, misery, never knowing if you think that's you, that you humbled yourself and you prayed enough and you seeked enough that you'll, you will get what? Forgiven. Um, what did I say? Exodus what? Verse 5. Thank you. It says, Now therefore... If ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for the earth is mine. Again, starting in Genesis and going to Revelations, picking up verses for you, you run into something like this, and it affects how you walk day to day. Not in liberty, but in bondage. Not in liberty, but in bondage. Because when we look at Romans 8, verse 2, well, on the way to Romans 8, 2, you can let go of that. On the way to Romans 8, 2, stop at 7. And look at verse 24. We covered this last week, Romans 7, 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Because it's New Year's, you make resolutions. And I used to joke when I work out regularly, I'll have my parking space back by March. Usually I'd have it back by the end of January. Now I would go to Bailey's, I'd have a certain parking space. You know, your creatures are heavy, like to park. Every one of you in here come to church and you basically park in the same space. But on New Year's, when going to a health club, what happens? No, everybody's there. And you don't get your parking space and it upsets you, right? And that's the way we're trying to give up sin in your own strength. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? different than what we read there in Exodus 19.5. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law 
of sin. And you look at the law in the Pauline epistles, it's the law of love and thankfulness and gratitude. Because we all know we deserve to go to hell. And just by simply trusting and believing in the message, eternal life forever, not ever having to worry about if we sin, God's going to get you. It's fantastic when I finally realized that. Because we acknowledge something. Now, we seek honest, biblical answers, not empty <coughs> tradition. We don't go by the so-called church fathers and what they wrote and what they said. Because we quoted that verse, these were more noble than those at Thessalonica, that they searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. That's the way we approach it. If it's in the Bible, it's to us, then by all means. If it's not there, it's not for us. It's that simple. So in here, we would rather trust God than mainstream liberalism and science falsely so called. Now turn with me to first John chapter five. First John chapter five. N not books that are written to us, but there's certainly a principle in here that we can take to the bank today. They probably won't give you any cash for it, but the bank of your heart how we live in our day-to-day -day life in liberty, which is different than what we read back there in Exodus and Second Chronicles, that if-then principle. Now in First John chapter 5, look at verse 9. It says, If we receive the witness of men, then there's a comma, and then what happens? The witness of God is greater. Now, today there are, we walk by faith, not by sight. There's going to be some sight things going on here, but the witness principle is there. Go back with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. The witness is greater. The witness is greater. God's witness is greater. That's a, a fabulous verse. It's the witness of men or the witness of God, essentially is what that said. The verse says, this witness of God, which he has testified of his son, is greater. But is the witness of God here today? And in Romans, we find out it is. Look at verse 18, Romans 1. Verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. This book. Because they that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. We used to have a bird called a cockatiel. And this thing was a smart bird. When it died, I cried like a baby. But anyway, um, I would just look at all the fine little detail on this bird. I used to sit up there and just stare at the little eyes and the little little colored feathers by his little eyes and how the little things would change. And I go, this is natural selection? Even in an unbelieving heart, you cannot say that there wasn't a designer before that looking at that bird and I remember in colleges and I was unsaved burning going to hell and I'm looking at all these biochemical reactions that the body puts out and the thing that popped in my mind and I was preaching it and teaching it um, evolution is it the Bible is wrong and I still remember driving down the street with with uh, friends of mine and we were in a red Mustang at a corner and there was this Bible thumper on the corner, and Mitzi stood up and said, You dumb Bible thumper! If the Bible said the world was flat, you'd believe it. And I said, Yeah, and I'm right there with them. 
And as I grew and just looked at the witness, I began to think, I got a big mouth. Maybe I better rethink my position. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Now, I, I, I said we walk by faith, not by sight. It's, it's the, the Christian life, now that I'm older, it, it, it comes back to things. I visited a, a guy for the first time I met on the Internet, and we, we were talking for like two hours, and he said to me, you know, you haven't cussed once. And I, 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 I thought about that later, and I go, well, I, I never made a New Year's resolution. I will stop swearing. I was looking for a pin the other day. You might not. <laughs> you might not believe that. That, but but. It, it is Christ living in me day by day, verse by verse, wanting to please my Savior, not putting myself in situations where I'll offend my Savior. I don't want my life on the planet to be a life of grieving, the Holy Spirit. And it comes by natural gratitude and liberty. Now, I know there's a lot of uh, talk about gun control, but look at um, Romans 2.3. What's, what's the problem with society? Right, and we'll look at that. One more verse after this one. And it says, And thinkest this, thou old man, thou judgest them which do such thing and does the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Now, when we were on our little trip through the Bible, Genesis to Revelations, we stopped at the if-then principle that said, if I do this, then I'll get God's blessing. Then we went a little longer to the Apostle Paul, and it says, simply believe. Now, if you could choose between the two, knowing Verse Romans 2, 3, And thinkest thou this, O man, that thou judgest them which do such thing, and does the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God, which program would you sign up for? You, one man in the Bible wanted to face God with his righteousness, and that was who? Job. Let me be weighed into even balance that God may know my righteousness. That's Job 31, verse 6. When God spoke to him in the whirlwind, he only had two lines left. I abhor myself, I am vile. And you look at the beginning of Job and see how he gave the charity how he opened his home, how he prayed, how he burnt burnt offerings for his kids, and you are going to stand against God with your man wisdom and dispute God? Mm, I don't think so. So what's the problem with society? Look at last verse, Romans 3, verse 18. This is the United States of America today. This should be right under the Pledge of Allegiance. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You look at TV, what was on when I was growing up, and you look at it now, and you want to barf. We uh, checked out a movie, had to be funny, some movie, Innocent Ted, older guy, has still has a teddy bear. How bad can it be? Within uh, 20 minutes, <laughs> there goes five ninety nine. What an awful movie. The guy's waking up, smoking pot. <laughs> Let's not go into that. But that's the kind of movies that are selling in Hollywood now. They don't acknowledge the witness of God. There is no fear of God with them. That, my friends, is what you'll find as you go through 
your Bible. Stop through Romans and Philemon and take a good look at our apostle. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the people here today. We thank you for your book that you'll have us have. We can understand all the questions of life and the joy and the little deep secrets and unlocking it. Give us joy beyond belief. In the Lord's name we pray. Amen.